Hello fellow space marines, or as I lovingly call you guys, final expense warriors. Hey, Matt Lowry here, the lead jerk. Got a really good interview with um, Lewis out of Tennessee. He's been around a while. He's um, probably been in this business, I guess, probably 50 plus years. And I thought it would be a really good interview to have with a guy that's not necessarily a quote-unquote final expense agent, but somebody that kind of has seen uh, things from beginning to current, kind of some of the changes he's seen in the life insurance industry, uh, the health insurance markets, the Medicare supplement industry, Medicare industry, and so forth. So he's been a debit agent. He's uh, so final expense, still does, um, and he also uh, sells a few cancer policies here and there. So... Um, a lot of good knowledge from the guy. He's been around. He's seen a lot. And um, I just thought, like I said, I thought it would be a good a good uh, interview to have to, you know, glean some knowledge from some of these guys that have been doing this for a long time. He's been doing it longer than I've been alive. So, with that being said, um, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, start up the uh, interview, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Evolved and, and what he does... Um, currently so Lewis you want to go ahead and, and and take it away and I just I guess my my first question to you would be how how'd you get how'd you get in this well I started in 1971 with National Life and Accident as a David agent spent uh, three years on the David and then spent a couple of years staff manager with them and then decided I wanted to be independent and so I left them and went independent so when you were when you were doing the debit work, what do you think was that in the was that in the maybe late seventies or was it earlier than that even? Oh, it's nineteen seventy one when I started. Oh, okay. On the debit. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of like that commercial says, uh, 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 We know some things because we've seen some things. Right. Uh, well, I don't know that I know anything, but I've seen a few things. Right. Right. <clears throat> so can you tell us kind of? What 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 did it involve back in those days? You know when um, that was actually the year I was born. What um what did it involve? Because so I, I you've got a lifetime of knowledge there right there. So what did it involve like on a daily basis? What did you do being being a debit agent for that company? What, what kind of what was involved with that? Well, I was going to say when I when I started on the debit, of course uh, I, I took an established debit. I had a book of business that I went uh, from house to house collecting. I didn't do any weekly collections. All mine were done bi-weekly or monthly. And uh, it's, it's funny, at that time here in this area, we had a couple of district offices in this area, and at that time there were about 43 debit agents working in this territory. Wow. And uh, now there's there's two or three. And uh, <coughs> uh, it really changed over the years. But, uh, you know, we worked our book of business, and we prospect. So when when you guys would run across each other, I mean, was it still was it still a competition like it is today, where you know if you were prospecting, you know, somebody and they had a you know another debit type policy, was it was it similar today that you would kind of look at it and see if it was the best fit for them, or was it mainly about obviously? Um, keeping the keeping the you know the the book up to date but what what kind of growth did those guys look for back then did they just want to maintain the book did, did the company bring in the agents or did the agents bring in the customers or no no you were expected to write business uh uh back then uh, uh three hundred dollars a week was was what everybody shot for as far as annual premium and i know that doesn't sound like much yeah, it's a lot back then Yep. That's an average. That's an average of seventeen hundred dollars a week today. Gotcha. And no leads. And that's what, <laughs> what we were expecting. To <clears throat> and no leads. That was Cole Camison. Just have him working your 
Uh, yeah, I mean, you might get some uh, referrals here and there, right? Yeah, you know, you know, a lot of the guys that work direct mail, they're, they're uh, you know, one and done, and there's nothing wrong with that. Sure. But, uh, and some agents prefer to do it that way, and they make tremendous amounts of money. Uh, other agents, they prefer to, to, to work the book of the business they've got, had other products in the house, uh, get referrals out of the house. You have, and working the debit, you always knew when the son or daughter was getting married, when a new baby was born and all this stuff. You, you had all this going on for you that you knew what was going on in the family. So they created a, a need for life insurance. So, sure. Right, and I would assume back then your persistency was probably a lot higher than it is today as well because people get hit from, you know, 30 different ways um, for well, really everything when you kind of think about it, including burial and cancer and health insurance, right? Right, right. Of course, we didn't do, the only health insurance we did was hospital and demi type stuff. Uh, okay. When, when I was on the debit, you know, well, nobody wrote major medical or anything on the debit that I knew of. And Lewis, I ask you this question not 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 to be funny because I actually don't know. Was Medicare around back then, like when you got started in in seventy uh, one? Yeah, I was trying to remember. Medicare started in when sixty five or so. I, okay. I can't remember when I left the Debbie in seventy five. That's what I went into as an independent was writing Medicare supplements primarily with United America. Okay. And that was the good old days of Medicare supplement because you got 60% first year and 15% lifetime renewals. Wow. Uh, not a, not at all like it was now. Right. So you didn't have all the government regulations. But right. When I got out of that market was uh, when they came out with Medicare Advantage and CMS and all that. Right, uh, right. Uh, I, you know, so. Yeah, all those roadblocks to success is what I call them. <laughs> right. So, okay, so you were with that company, and then you left there, and you went into, I think you just said, Medicare Supplement. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what, what did that involve? Did, did anything, and what, and what year was that? How, what do you think that was? How long, how long were you in with the other company, and then when you rolled over to, well, to Metsup? I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how long I was with Wow. Uh, I, did, I didn't know that. Up. I did not know that. Up. You know, uh, whenever CMS started, just when I, uh, or when Medicare Select came out, just when I, <coughs> right. I got out of it. But, uh, right. A lot of people don't know, realize there's a, there's a, there's a select program, too. Business, so. Right. So, then you transitioned out of that, and what did you, what did you go into? I guess the, the simplified issue, cancer, um, Probably some hospital indemnity here and there too, right? Dental stuff like that, maybe vision. Right, right. You started when did you start that? You think maybe middle nineties or? Yeah, well, the, the cancer had always done from right the, from the time I got in the business on, and uh, I always found it a good market. And uh, of course, it was a simple market. You didn't have to worry about getting the plan issued because of people's health or anything like that. Right. And, uh, <laughs> right. But uh, I had a friend that, that he canvassed businesses in small towns. He lived in Maryville, Tennessee. And he sold nothing but cancer insurance. And he had a saying one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And uh, that's pretty well what he did. He, he wrote on the average of 10 to 12 a week and made a very, very good living at it. Now, how did it work then when when you guys, like, did they have uh, any kind of regional or national advertising to support an agent? I mean, obviously, they, they really don't now either, but, you know, sometimes companies advertise, depending on who they are, the bigger ones do. But 
Um, what? How, how did you actually get out in front of people? Just cold canvassing, or did they, you know, word of mouth? And it, it was basically you, you know, you were on your own to, to get your prospects. They deserve <clears> stuff, <throat> and it still is. You know, it, you know, you if yeah. you're doing direct mail, you're only paying for it yourself, or you're giving up a big chunk of the commission you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're paying for it one way or the other. Uh, they they did not. Uh, do anything to, to help the agent prospect that was up to the agent and uh, prospecting basically was uh, canvassing or, or uh, referrals again working your book of business and uh, and that sort of thing let me, let me ask uh, you this uh, Lewis your market was really primarily referrals once, once you got a family or two uh-huh. uh, insured there they liked the service you gave them uh, then they would tell everybody about you, and uh, so it, it was it was fairly easy in those days. Well, let me ask you this, Lewis. Uh, what about back then, and as far as like sales, <clears throat> actual sales training and prospect training, like from a from an agency perspective, from an agent level, you know, agency level. Did have you seen? Because uh, I can just guess, but. There's some of that now, but not. I don't think it's really prevalent like it was in the past. And I'm going by other industries I've been involved in. Have you seen any kind of change with that, where there's not as much sales trainer prospect training? You know, from uh, even a carrier's point of point of view, with a with an agent group, I just I just don't see it that often. I mean, they have webinars, but you know, it's always uh, let's see Tuesday at. 11 a.m. where everybody's in the field. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I start saying, why do they always have these webinars when you should be out in the field selling? I, I know, the people yeah, they I, need to reach. I don't understand that. The people they need to I reach are the ones writing business that are not available during that time. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's because the people that are sitting in the home office don't work. I, I guess so, you day. know. <laughs> I guess. Maybe some but of them anyway, will hear this and uh, change some of that. <laughs> Yeah. Put it that way. Sure. That they, they gave any training. I, I've never seen anybody on the independent side that really, really did any training. You, you pretty well on your own. Uh, if you contracted under uh, a general agent or something, he might do some training for you. Uh, but, but it wasn't any better than it is now. And that's the reason that ninety percent of the people that go into the business wind up out of the business with right. three or four years. <clears throat> right, exactly. Yeah, they don't. They really don't understand. I, mean, I kind of think you gotta have an idea, unless you come up like you have, where it's just like, you know, you've been at forty-five years. I mean, nowadays, unless you understand how a business operates, it's it's tough. I mean, it's it's uh, it can be a grind. It's it's a good grind, but it can be it can be tough. Uh, make no bones about that. Let me ask you this. Um. When you said you went into you know the Medicare and you were doing that, um, what was it like when CMS? Because this I always, I always like to go back in time and see kind of how things were, um, and hear, hearing it from you is you know really cool because I can get an idea on how it might have felt. What did it feel like when when CMS come out and made all their changes? Was there a big lead up to it where people were like, "There's a rumbling. It's like up oh, something's fixing to change." Because I know quite a few agents. I know myself used to do MA, and then even when they made changes additionally to MA, uh, they got out. But uh, a lot of them, like you said, that you knew, um, you know, even before MA was available, when, Medi- you know, when uh, just the regular Medicare was making changes, people were like, well, I'm done with that. I'm, I'm not going to, you know. Was there a leading up to all the regulation, or was it just, um, you know, all of a sudden? Uh-huh. The only thing we went through basically is, you know, we changed from the Medicare supplements that we're writing that uh, could have uh, benefits, not every company had the same benefits, you know, supplemental benefits, and more right. maybe, until they came out with the standardized plans and, and uh, what have you. That, that's the only change that really didn't affect the customer that much. No, the only real change you had was premiums, you know, 
premiums are going up. Right. Uh, we went, most companies went from, well, almost all, I don't know anybody now that writes uh, uh, an issue age policy anymore. Everybody's going to attained age. Uh, back when I started, we had a lot of them that wrote issue age, so you didn't have age rate changes at the same time you had annual increases. So, right. Uh, made it a little softer. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't feel it as much or at all, really, because it was already padded, I guess, in there for them. Um, so, what, what, what's your day like now? What do you, or, you know, um, what do you, what do you do now? I know that, you know, obviously you've, you, you stay busy, obviously. <laughs> um, you, you talking about, you talking about when I get out of bed? Or, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, I'm, Yep. I have slowed down tremendously. I worked uh, in the field seven hours yesterday. Wow. Uh, I, I, and blanked. Uh, run into one nutcase that I'm, I'm glad I'm in a business that I can say adios. Who I do business with. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he, was, he was about like uh, uh, the one that uh, uh, Reardon ran into. The, yeah. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! But but anyway, I, I, you know, uh, today I've uh, I've not worked any at all, and, you know, and, and that's the reason I don't write a lot of business is because you got to work to write business. Yeah, I, I am a full time minister, so that right. takes a lot of time. Sure. That's also the reason why I do not buy leads. I, I have nothing against buying leads, but I think you can you can make money in this business. You might not be the uh, the big hitter like some of them without buying leads and final expense but uh, I don't want to tie myself down to, to run them right exactly because uh, once they start coming in you kind of got to do something with them or it's a waste of money sure the last leads I bought I bought from Glenn uh, back before Christmas and mm -hmm. that's the sorriest set of leads I've ever seen because not one yeah. of them has called me <laughs> and told me to come out and see them <laughs> You gotta call them first, Lewis. Oh, oh, oh! Is that the way it works? <laughs> That's the way it works. <laughs> oh, I thought he just sent me the list, and then I sat by the phone and waited for him to call. Yeah, <clears throat> and they'll have the pen out and the application already filled out for you. Matter of fact, they might even mail it to us. <laughs> well, that's the same way those avatar leads work. Or, or, they yeah, work? yeah, yeah. You you get you get the name and the number and then they it's actually all digital. They actually email you the app, already e sign and everything. You don't even have to send it to the carrier. You just they just hit a button and it's all done. Oh good, good, yeah. I'll take you. Yeah. So <clears throat> obviously being a minister keeps you busy, I can, I can imagine. And um so do you what do you write what do you write most of these days? I know <clears throat> we talked before, and you you write. Um, Seems like you write a decent amount of cancer. Um, I, I know that uh, you know you're a true believer in that product, and uh, you do simplified issue too. And so, what what do you what do you do? You know, what's your average day if you're gonna? You know, you probably work a lot off referrals though. Now that I'm thinking about it, <clears throat> um, I said you probably work a lot off of like your book. You know, like you were saying, you probably got. Hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of people you've touched across your life that well, no, no use the well, insurance guy. I, I, <clears throat> I, I don't have as many and don't have the book that you would think I do because I kind of put the business on the back burner while I went into another business for uh -huh. about 14, 15 years, which turned out in the long run to be a big mistake. Uh -huh. but, you know, but it's done, so there's no, no sense fretting over it. Sure. Uh, uh, but I, I was uh, in the antique, uh, specializing in uh, glass and pottery, and the bottom fell out of that market. So, right. Uh, so, but, but anyway, when, when I get out and work in the field, I, I normally uh, will canvas. Yesterday, I was working some orphan policy holders for a company that they had sent me some names. Uh, I do stuff like that. I work referrals. Uh, I, I still canvas some. Uh, I don't do as much of it as I should. Uh, I canvas uh, primarily for uh, final expense, 
us, and then, you know, if they don't get any interest there, I'll try switching off to the cancer product. Uh, I've thought about changing it around, but I've just gotten the habit of doing things the way I do sure. it. Sure, yep. You know, you, oh, when you do it over, you don't change too often. Right. <clears throat> Especially uh, if it's worked for you in the yeah. past, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, last week I wrote, uh, I wrote, uh, one, two, three, I wrote three final expense apps and one cancer app. Wow. And, uh, I don't work, uh, I don't work the, the really low income areas. Right. I don't work, work typical final expense. If I do any full time, I probably would. Sure. They're making all the money I could. Sure. It gets interesting. <laughs> I know it's sad sometimes, yeah. You bring up a good point on that, Lewis. It's, it's, and I find this, it really irritates me that there's so many people out there that think they're going to have that insurance once they retire, and <clears throat> they don't. They're never told that. I mean, it's really, um, it's sad because people end up being in their uh, early to middle 70s and find out their insurance is going away. And, I mean, clearly probably 20% of the people that I see, that's the case. Um, a lot of them still employed and they don't realize that once that's gone, it's gone. And then the light goes off and they realize, well, I need to get something in place. Obviously, it's permanent. Nobody has control over it but them, right? And it's just, uh, you know, I would assume back when you started doing it, it wasn't even called final expense. That's, you know, that's a marketing term. Was it just simplified issue, you know, simple issue? Uh, well, when I started, really, nobody was really doing simple issues. It was it, even the weekly premium policies were underwritten. Uh, I mean, they didn't do physicals and, and that sort of thing, but they might do an APS on it. Uh, and uh, and you had to fill out a, a full out. And uh, uh, you know, and, and I I know uh, with another company that I was with wasn't with. Uh, uh, they came out with a return of premium plan two-year return of premium plan. And their, their district manager told them, said, boys, we can legally do what we've been doing all along. <laughs> in other words, what they'd been doing all along was filling out the house. No, no, never done. Had to put them 51 and send them in, get them issued, and if they died in two years, it would return a premium. Right. Uh, you know, but, uh, uh, so, uh, that return of premium plan, as far as I know, that, that was the first company I knew of that, that was independent life. And uh, we, we never did have it uh, with National Life when I was with them. Interesting. So what, what kind of changes have you seen other than the, the maybe agent's mentality? Um, what kind of, have you seen the temperament from carriers change? Since the 70s? I'm sorry, what kind, of, what kind of changes have I seen? Yeah, like temperament as far as the attitude or the, you know, just overall how people, um, you know, do business since early 70s to now as far as like, you know, a carrier, like how, you know, what are the, you know, their values as far as how they value their field force or anything like that. I mean, I can only I'm, imagine there's been a, I'm not seeing, you know. As far as the agency force, I'm not seeing a, a, a lot of change one way or the other. Right. Attitude. Sure. And, uh, uh, they're good and bad, and, and, and what have you. They, they're still the same. Uh, back when I started, we made a pretense of 
replacement being bad, but then everybody did it. Yeah. But if you're going to do it, this is how you do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not supposed to do this, but this is the way you do it if you're going to. And, uh, you know, the main change I've seen is in the, when it comes to prospecting and getting out and talking to people, is people are still welcoming, but they're not as welcoming as they were to invite you in your in their home when you do it knock on the door and what have you. Right. It, it's a little harder to get in the door. People are a little more leery of you, a little more cautious sure. than, than they were back in the day. Uh, once you get in the home and get to talking with them and get to know them, then, then there's no difference. Uh, I've not noticed any difference in the attitude toward insurance. I don't run into uh, any greater number of people that are interested in insurance than I did back then or vice versa. It's, you know, I've not seen any change. Their products have changed tremendously. Uh, paperwork has changed tremendously in this paperless society we're in. Yeah, expand on that a little bit, Lewis. Tell us a little bit about what, what you've seen on that. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to say uh, all the extra forms that, that you've got now uh, uh you know, it's particularly the, 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 the outlines of coverage and the health insurance, the outlines of coverage and all that kind of stuff uh-huh. that you didn't used to have. You know, you left them a brochure, you have a little one-page app with a bank draft on it, and and uh, that's all you had. Uh, you did have a replacement form, uh, but all, all these rest of these forms that you have to have, you know, now, some companies, uh, like Washington National, they issue a, a big, thick booklet with every application that has got all the forms in it that you need. Wow. Uh, uh, you know, because you've got to have the, the outline of coverage. you got to have the, if you're writing a life insurance, you got accelerated benefits, you've got to have an accelerated benefit disclosure. That's right. Nursing home waivers. Yeah, you know, everything, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just all kinds of stuff that, that we didn't have to put up with, didn't you think underwriting's changed much? Mm, not really. Yeah. Not really. Uh, uh, because what you know on the underwriting final expense underwriting now, uh, it's already got a table full of rating built into it. Right. We used to get more rated policies back because we wrote everything in standard rates. And then if they had high blood pressure or something, it would be rated. And, and uh, you know, but with the simplified issue apps, you've gone away with that because it's already rated for it anyway. And then if you got a real healthy person, they're, they're uh, <laughs> you know, the company's getting a table four rating on, on a standard issue. So... Yeah, that should be putting a little money in their pocket. Sure, surely it does, because they're living longer. And ha- has have women always been less less expensive, <laughs> rate wise, than men? I mean, I just I have to explain that to you. Have me have have women always been less expensive on insurance than men, as far as you've seen? I mean, I have to explain that. You know, I always say, hey, you you know, I don't care if your wife's seven years. I've been in the business. It has been. Yeah. Since I've been in the business, it used to be. Now, when I first started, blacks paid a higher rate than whites. Really? Yeah. And when I first started, we had products that we could sell to, in the black community that we could not sell in the white community, some sickness, sickness and accident plans from what had me. Right. And uh, that, that came to a stop just not long after I, I came into business, but... Uh, yeah, there, there was a time when, when blacks paid a, a, a higher premium, and uh, we said that's all done away with now. Sure. Women, there's always been male-female rates, yeah. and women have always, since I've been in business, paid less for life insurance and more for health insurance. Right, yep. Uh, and, you know, yeah. it, it's funny if you're talking to a couple, I'll always explain before I get into it, hey, look, 
and sometimes it doesn't matter if the uh, if the husband's younger. I mean, I've I've seen rates higher on a five year band there where the husband's five years younger than the wife, but his insurance is still more expensive. <laughs> yeah, his insurance still be the same as hers, maybe even more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess they think well, men are all gonna go hang gliding. What's that, Lewis? Yeah. They do outlive us. Yeah. 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 Contrary to yeah. popular belief or whoever the uh, the uh, number crunchers are in the risk uh, yeah, risk I underwriters, know. we don't hang glide, not all of us. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, they've always told me that women drive men to the early days. Well, there you go. That, you know what, that could be <laughs> statistical, verifiable proof. In the numbers and charts and data from insurance companies, <laughs> there, there it is. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, and I didn't know. I, I'm just kind of winging this right here now. I didn't know. You know, I don't even know if you have, Louis. If you got kids, grandkids, great grandkids, great great grandkids. I don't know. Um, and if you do, well, I've got, I've got. Uh... I've got three kids. Yeah. Eight grandkids. Wow. Two great grandkids. One of them I'm raising. One of them you're. And I got custody of her when she was four months old. And she, mm. she is, will be one year old Friday. Oh, so you have her. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we, we've had her for, for eight months now. Wow. Cool. Changed my house and my schedule and everything totally. Oh, I bet. <laughs> No more empty nest. No more empty nest. <laughs> uh, no sleeping at 9 o'clock in the morning anymore. Right. <laughs> Probably hardly any sleep at all. <laughs> so, no, she sleeps yeah. all night besides my wife's the one to get up with her. But, right. But, uh, but then when she gets up, she comes in to find Pappy. Right. And it's time for you to get up. She's got to tell you about it. Sir? <laughs> She she got to wake you up and tell you all about it. <laughs> That's what my wife did anyway. Um, what what do you what do you um see coming along for them? You know, as obviously as you're seeing your next couple of generations coming up. You know, as far as health care, as far as um you know life coverage, what is that any concern from you? You know, being that you've seen kind of the full. You know, as long as you've been doing this, you you have any concerns going forward? You know. I know I do a little bit from my kids, but um, I always well, like to ask people that. I really don't look for the life market to change any. Right. Uh, any time in the future, but the health market, who knows? Yeah, it's unstable. Uh, you know, uh, I would have never thought uh, even 20 years, even 10 years ago, I would have never thought you'd had as much involvement with the federal government as you do in the insurance market. Right. Today. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, you said the, the insurance, it was strictly a state affair. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it should still, and it should still be. It should still be, you know. Yeah. That's but, a matter uh, of opinion, you know. Should be and, and being is two different things. Yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've already got to that age, you know, where now I'm at the point where I really, I don't accept things. But I just kind of am at the point where I'm like, well, I'm not going to question why it is. Most, most of the time I know why. I'm just going to accept the fact that it is what it is. And, you know, it, you know I, I guess I could say this and feel okay. You know, and you probably feel close the same way. Uh, we're kind of in, in that situation because we kind of let that happen anyway. So, oh, yeah. you know, it, it's one of those things where... But I'll say this, if if market doesn't respond the way it needs to, even in a uh, single-payer system of God, if it come to that, uh, which is the next, you know, totem pole hole that I hope never gets filled, but um, if the market doesn't respond, if it ends up, you know, causing, uh, you know, serious, serious uh, implications to people's health, I, I you know, it could, it could. It could change. 
Um, but that's, I agree with you. That 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 healthcare market is just um, it's gone back and forth. And I mean, even um, us having almost thirty years of age difference, it it quite shocked me um, how all that's been regulated. You know. I mean, the system was being abused by everybody. Yeah, it was. The insurance companies, the lawyers, the doctors, the clients, I mean, the patients. Big Pharma, you know, don't forget the pill pushers. Uh, <laughs> and that, that, that's like, as far as the patients go, I've heard people say, oh, that insurance, those, all those insurance companies are crooks and they just do this and they do that. And, and you know, I've, I've told them, people, I said, I've seen more people try to take advantage of insurance companies yeah. I have insurance companies try to take advantage of people. Right. <clears throat> Those, yeah, I, I've seen, I don't know how many claims have been made up and, and falsified and what have you trying to make a buck. Yep. So, you know. Fraud always ends up costing the consumer in one way or another, you know? Yep. So. So. Well, cool. Um, wow, we've already been on here like 37 minutes. Um, well, look, I appreciate it a ton you being on here. Um, I know you probably got things to take care of, and you're, you got people to go see and things to take care of, especially with that, with that baby y'all got. So um, God bless you for that. <laughs> um, and uh, any, any parting words you, you want to leave, Lewis, to you know guys that are, you know, Probably strictly speaking, the newer guys maybe that are because you know once we've been in this five ten years, like anything else, we get hard headed. But maybe to the new guys that are listening, that um you know been in this maybe you know a year or two, uh you know any anything you could tell them that maybe maybe could help them um you know during what I call the grind, whatever whatever they're doing in their in their life insurance you know Medicare insurance business. I appreciate that, Lewis. I do. I really do. I do. And I'll go back to being a homeowner. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, look, um, I'm going to let you roll, and I'm going to wind this down. And, uh, again, I really I really appreciate your time, uh, you know, kind of taking us through, you know, the early 70s through current and kind of what you've had going on and everything. And, uh, you know, yeah. Go get you some rest. Finish up what you got today. Get you some rest because I know that baby's gonna be uh, that baby's gonna be calling for you soon. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm well rested today. I need to go out and grab a piece of business. I've not written one this week. There you go. Go do it. It's only let's see. It's only Tuesday, right? You got time. Right. <laughs> you probably have three right. or four written for the end of the week. <laughs> it's always good to have one the first part of the week, though. <laughs> it is. Kind of keeps you pumped up and gets you motivated for the rest of the week. I know. Oh, I've had goose days. Let me tell you, uh, that's a bad feeling to have seven or eight appointments and you don't, you don't, you know, you don't sell anything. That's uh, <laughs> they don't happen often, but <clears throat> when they do, you just got to get back on the side on the next day. So I can say, there, there's nothing worse than, than a blank week. Yep, and we all have them, so everybody needs, to, you know, yeah, that's right. think we about that. that. Yeah. If you have a blank, if you have a blank weeks, you're not making any money. So. That's right. It all averages out. 
All righty. Well, look, again, I appreciate your time. Uh, go get done what you got to do, and I'm sure I'll be uh, talking to you again soon, Lewis. Okay, we're talking to you, man. Okay. Have a good one. God bless. I thank you so much, Lewis. Bye bye. All righty, guys. There you go. Really good interview with Lewis. Um, I appreciate his time to talk with us. To you know, like I said, it's not your uh, your typical final expense type interview, but I think from time to time it's good that we uh, look outside the box sometimes just to keep up with what's going on elsewhere. Um, doesn't mean we can't learn um, from other uh, other markets and verticals within the insurance industry. So some of the same philosophies apply no matter what. So. I appreciate you guys listening and uh, reach out to us anytime. And remember, for the best final expense leads in the nation, visit www.theleadjerk.com. Again, www.theleadjerk.com. Y'all have a good one. Bye-bye.